Hello, YouTube, the internet, and the planet. It's your bro, Yo Elliot. And today is April 10th, 2019, and I turn 40. So 40 years ago today, I was delivered to the planet. And for the past 40 years, I've been delivering my consciousness to the planet. And so what I've decided is for my 40th birthday that I wanted to create a video and I wanted to relate to you and to the world and to make known to myself and to God 40 things I was wrong as fuck about in my last 40 years of life. So that's what we're going to be doing here today in this video, going over my list of 40 things I was wrong as fuck about. And before I get started, I kind of, I'd like to draw your attention to my surroundings here. Um, I became popular on YouTube making videos in my old warehouse gym that, uh, that I had used to make thousands of YouTube videos that you guys got to know me from. In 2015, I left the gym and I went into a tunnel. I went into a uh, healing process, you might say, or a holing process making myself whole. And in doing so, I stopped making YouTube videos. You know, I've been making them sporadically since around 2016. And I left my gym. And one of the hardest things for me to establish in my rec my recurrent attempts at coming back to YouTube is having a a, uh, a proper place to, to do it. Look at my lip bleeding. Look at that. Lip cracking. My lip hasn't bled in... Lord knows how long, but here today I'm making my first video and I think it makes perfect sense because I'm going to be coming rough, rugged, primal, and raw right from the mouth, right from my lips. So I'm just going to let that blood drip. I'm going to let it just be on, my, be on my lips throughout this entire video. That's amazing. What an omen. I wonder what that means. Anyway, uh, <laughs> back to the point at hand. I'm here in my, what is actually my bedroom. And I've kind of turned it into a bit of a studio here so that I can begin recording some videos on uh, a bit of a, a regular basis here again. I've tried many different uh, locations in my home and different formats for these videos. Um, and I'm still not exactly sure what I'm going to do. I'm not even sure if this is where I'm supposed to stay. I'm just going to get rolling now because I promised by my 40th birthday that I'd be doing a number of things. The number one of which is getting in the best shape of my life. And for those of you guys who've been following me. Look, I even got blood on my teeth. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> uh, if you've been following me on my YouTube channel, my Strength Camp YouTube channel, because those of you guys know that I have multiple ch channels, uh, I talked about being in my final or fittest phase by 40, and uh, I'm pretty much there. If you can't tell by the way I look just in my face, I'm lean. I'm leaner than I've probably ever been. In fact, I weigh the same amount as I weighed in ninth grade. I haven't been... Uh, down to 170-ish pounds is where I'm at right now since the ninth grade. Uh, a lot of people are concerned that I, you know, Elliot's lost a lot of muscle. Uh, look, building muscle is easy for me. I've always been uh, gifted at being able to build muscle, but getting lean hasn't always been easy for me. And so I'm willing to sacrifice muscle, which I did, but I'm still strong as hell. Still got a ton of muscle. If you follow me on Instagram, I've been putting up pictures of myself bare chested. And if you enjoy uh, looking at bare chested E, you can watch some of my old videos and you can compare them to how I look bare chested these days. And uh, and I look great. Got to admit. So I'm OK with it. Uh, throughout the rest of this coming opening season for me. I'm going to be sharing many of my strategies for getting as lean as I am now. Uh, and as light as I am right now, you know, I've always been, since you've known me, I've been 200 plus pounds, you know, and 250 was my heaviest back when I was a pro strong man. And so someone asked me on my, uh, in, one of my Instagram posts, they said, Elliot, uh, how is your, <laughs> how's your commitment to becoming enlightened also too? Cause you know, people know I'm very spiritual. And, uh, and I had to remind him that the body is the mind especially the way I look at it and the way I experience life. And to become enlightened is to become lighter. So I'm lighter on my feet, light like the wind, light like light. And so uh, 
dropping the weight through fasting, which is a big part of what I'm going to be talking to you guys about. And videos later on has been a tremendous part of my awakening and enlightening process. It's funny because as I venture down into the catabasis of my uh, holing process, the tunnel, uh, I remember back in 2016 that my soul had called me to begin fasting. Yeah, 2016, uh, three years ago, and I resisted. <laughs> it was funny because, you know, I, I know I was going into a, a season in my life where I was going to need to, to face some demons, face some darkness, wrestle with those dragons and come out victorious on the other side, death and rebirth. And, uh, and I, I started off getting prompts from the soul to stop consuming and I didn't listen. Instead, I began hiring therapists and coaches <laughs> and I took their advice. And so it was one of the things that I did wrong. And so, um, I'm going to, I'm going to move on. You know, I figure I'd just give you guys a little update on to where I am, what I'm doing, what's up. But I'm going to move on now because I don't want this video to be that much longer than <laughs> an hour. And hopefully it won't take that long because I want to move through these. I have a tendency to rant and rail and ramble. I know many of you guys enjoyed that. So um, that's why I don't mind making this video a little bit longer. But I've got 40, 40 bullet points here that I, that I laid in my hammock this morning after my walk and jotted down from one to 40, all ways Elliot Hulse was wrong as fuck. Way number one, I am invincible. I was completely wrong about being invincible. In fact, when I was a kid, I used to think that I could run through walls and I would actually even punch through walls. And I was great at football because when we were on kickoff team, I was the guy that ran full speed down head. They called me the wedge breaker and I'd put my head right through any number of 300 pound dudes, even though I was probably about 185 pounds because I thought I was invincible. Well, these past few years, God has shown me just how breakable I am. And so it's been funny that I have broken, uh, I tore both my left and right bicep uh, and I tore my Achilles tendon and I fell on my head and had a really bad neck injury and I had a hernia repaired all within just the last few years. Like I say, the body is the mind. And as I went down into my tunnel experience so that I can be broken down, digested, assimilated and utilized once again by the great father above, uh, I had to be reminded that I am mortal. And everybody who lives here in 3D in the flesh lives in a dust suit. And no matter how powerful we may come think to think we are, uh, we will be reminded at some point in some way, especially those of us who take great stock in our physical strength, that uh, you're not invincible, dude. So that's number one. Number two, I was wrong. <laughs> I'm trying to say these in a dramatic way so I can edit these videos pretty cool. So I'm going to do this again. I got to hold it up here. That's why. Way number two that I was wrong as fuck was about women being sugar and spice and everything nice. When I was younger, I only saw women as sugar and spice and everything nice. I had this angelic veneer about women. They were meek and pretty and smelled well, smelled good and, um, only had good, compassionate intentions. These are really, you know, the things that I believed and thought about women. I grew around, I grew up around all boys, <laughs> mostly boys, king of the boys, the whole neighborhood was boys. I was the oldest of boys. And so I had all kinds of misconceptions and dreams about what women really were. And uh, I was wrong. In fact, it turns out that women are just as power hungry as men are, except that they do it by subtle means. They do it by passive means. I know that here in the West that we've all been kind of fed a load of bullshit in terms of how we're conditioned in school and through the media. And I think one of the ones that uh, 
one of the loads of bullshit that many men, including myself, and that's why I bring this up, uh, accepted, uh, is the nature of the sexes, particularly the nature of women. And so I'm going to, I'm going to just leave it there that, you know, women aren't just sugar and spice and everything nice. There are dark demonic elements to the feminine spirit, just as there are for men. And that it is, uh, it is a great service to men to free ourselves from the illusion of what women are. And it also frees them also too, so that we can stand in the power that we inherit as men and, uh, and continue to live that contrast. Way number three that I was wrong as fuck was about Jesus. You might even see Jesus. Oh, right. I got to get this backwards thing going right up there. And you also see the chakras and you see the crown and Jesus's crown uh, around his head there. Anyway, uh, you know, I've been I've been a fan of Jesus for many, many years. Uh, my relationship with Jesus has have wa has waxed and waned. And one of the ways that it waned was when I began to adopt the feminized version of Jesus, the beta Jesus that the Western world post um, Protestantism had adopted. And so I began to see Christianity and I began to, to look at Jesus in the weak way that he, they have been portrayed. And probably part of the reason why many men reject Christianity today, because if you know the, the church is steadily declining in its male enrollment, and, uh, and for good reason, because, you know, I try, I even go to some of the churches in my, in my neighborhood and in my city from time to time, but uh, I just can't dig the flat, flaccid, soft, feminine way that they're constantly portraying what I believe to be the ultimate alpha male. Jesus has to be the alpha male because if he is the perfect expression of what a man is to be on the planet, God on earth, that he must be a strong alpha male leader. There's no two ways about it. He can't be Jesus if he's not alpha. And uh, many of the meek and mild ways that they uh, portray him don't measure up. And so we can go to scripture and um, people like to do that. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's necessary. You know, in fact, I think that's pretty beta also, too, to constantly need to refer to a book to tell you what to think and what to what to do and how to how to believe. Uh, it's a great reference. But to be alpha, to be Jesus is to transcend all that also, too. That's why he broke the laws and recreated the laws. And he said that we could be born again every single day. And that's up to you. It's up to you to die to the old shit, the old books, the old ideas, the old lessons, the old conditioning in your old self every single day so that you can be reborn in a brand new way just like the sun my man jc jesus christ not jason capital <laughs> jc you're a, you're a cool dude too okay way number four that i was wrong as fuck was as it relates to global warming again no one no another one of those things that we've been force-fed and and made to adopt through our feminized culture because it they don't use facts to prove global global warming it's all very emotional and that's how you know we the the political left tries to manipulate us it's always through emotion there's no rationale whatsoever and science has shown and it's conclusive that whatever global warming we're experiencing right now is normal it's natural and it's to be expected based on normal natural cycles of nature and so uh if you're willing to do the research if you're willing to, to dig a bit deeper you'll learn how many scientists have been digging into the ice caps in order to almost like uh you know when you when they break the rocks you could look at what the climate was like at various seasons well they can do the same thing with the ice and i saw some programs programming uh that that talks about this. I mean, you, you just, you do your own research. Um, the, the agenda that's associated with this, con this conditioning, this brainwashing as it relates to global warming has everything to do with what I believe they call agenda 21, which is to depopulate the planet. 
I think overpopulation is a bullshit also too. I think that's a lie also that we are being fed so that they can be depopulate the planet. And so uh, I don't want to get too much into conspiracy theories, but I don't really think the theories are theories any longer. They're mostly conspiracy facts. If you're willing to look a little bit deeper and uh, and global warming is one that just needs to be thrown out the whole fucking baby and the bathwater. None of it makes any goddamn sense. And it's making us crazy. We're doing crazy things. We're making bad decisions about what we do to our environment. I look up in the in the sky every day and I see all those crisscrosses of lines that they're spraying uh, all kinds of aluminum and shit in the air uh, that they had been denying that they were spraying, but it's there. I mean, I see it almost every day now, you know, they, and um, and now they it's if you look Bill Gates, big funder of this. They're claiming that it's uh, they're putting a protective barrier up between us and the sun to protect us from glo global warming. I think Jesus as the sun and the sun as our deliverer, as our creator, are uh, synonymous. And so as the secular world has tried to block out Jesus, I got to get this right, block Jesus out of our lives. You know that Marxism, socialism loves secularism. They hate religion. Uh, it, it kind of is like or along the same lines of them blocking out the sun, the physical sun in our lives. So we suffer because we no longer get the light of God. And so they're blocking out the fucking sun. It's, it's crazy. We're doing some dumb stuff like we're smarter than nature. Um, global warming's bullshit. I'm going to move on because that's only number four. Number five, I was wrong as fuck about having to finish everything that you start. I really and truly believe that it was important for me to finish everything that I start. You know, so for example, I started off on YouTube like a bat out of hell and I didn't finish. I see guys that are still going. They're still going strong. And um, I just stopped, you know. And it doesn't mean that I wasn't finished. I was finished. I was finished for that. But the reason why I say that, say this to you, is because I've always felt guilty. I put this up there because uh, I have a tendency to start things without finishing them, and it's right and it's normal for me to do so. I am an Aries, and I am also an astrology fan. And so uh, one of the branches, one of the things I learned from astrology, particularly my one of my teachers, Stephanie Azaria. Uh, is that all of the signs, archetypes, are antiquated and that they have been upgraded. And so as an Aries, you know, it has been traditionally seen as a, as a ram, as an animal. And, uh, and what's more fitting, actually, is the spark. And so as an Aries, I'm a spark. And I know that. I don't need, again, I don't need astrology to tell me that, just I don't, like I don't need the Bible to tell me how Jesus was. Um, I just look at my own life. I look at the experience that I have. I look at how I'm delivering myself to the world and what goes on around me. And there is a raging flame fires everywhere across this entire planet that I started, but I don't finish. And so I'm a spark. I'm a spark of divine creation. I start things and it's not my job to, fi to finish it. Just like when a spark catches a leaf, he did his job. He dies in the flame and then the forest fire rages. And so uh, that is my nature. That is normal and natural. And that whatever guilt I've ever had about not finishing things that I've started, uh, I, I can put away now. Number six, the need, the necessity of eating fruits and vegetables to be healthy. Now, this is kind of a new one for me as these past few months in particular I have been exploring uh, fasting, prolonged fasting. I mean, I've been doing fasting since 2002 as a spiritual practice, but I decided to take it on as a physical practice, as something to uh, support my physiology and health. And in doing so, I have been looking at various different means for developing and maintaining strong vitality once I reintroduce food back into my life. And now that, uh, you know, I've gone through my uh, many prolonged fasts since November, the last of which was a 10-day fast, I'm ready to begin consuming again. 
And so you might even say that I'm lean bulking because I'm going to stay lean, but I'm going to put that muscle back on. Y'all see, y'all watch, watch and see how quickly I put that muscle on. But um, I've been really fascinated with and have been exploring this idea of the carnivore diet. And so I know it's kind of been a, a, a big thing or catching, catching the, f the flames have been catching some wind these past few months in particular, but maybe like the past year. And although I've always had a, I've had a, a primal sense that eating only meat would be good for me. Um, and I also knew from studying the work of Weston Price 15 years ago that it was, it, could, it was completely possible if you were to eat the entire animal from ruder to tuda, ruder to duder, from the nose to the tail, as Paul Saladino MD would, would say, and uh, he's one of the guys that I've been learning a lot from. And, uh, and I really and truly uh, not only accept this idea, but I've experienced it where I've had to do elimination diets because I'm trying to heal myself from various skin conditions and how you might say uh, autoimmune stuff. And so uh, you can really get everything that you need I know that I can, and I know that you can too. It's not my job to convince you uh, by eating just meat. You don't need fruits and vegetables. It's not necessary. In fact, it's not nearly as superior a multivitamin or a, uh, a source of vitality as meat is. And so I'll leave it at that. Number seven, I was wrong about responding to detractors. And so I've kind of always known this, uh, but there was a moment when some of the my fellow fitness YouTubers thought it was important to uh, to detract, to to take stabs at, and to uh, dare I say, humble Yo Elliot. And uh, although I appreciate it because it exposed me to what I was wrong about, it definitely exposed me to some of my shadows, uh, which we'll talk about in some of the other numbers here. Uh, but it, uh, it reminded me that it's, no, it's not important to defend yourself. It's never, especially verbally, I'm all about defending yourself with guns and, and fists. That's why I'm learning Muay Thai and I got a bunch of guns. So, uh, yeah, you got to be able to defend yourself. But as far as your ideas are concerned, there is no reason to ever have to defend yourself to those who detract. Because ideas are ephemeral. They're metaphysical. They come and go. They change just like science does. And I'll talk a little bit about that also, too. Because science is constantly changing. Ideas is constantly changing. So uh, if someone is not vibing with my ideas... It is not my job to convince them. It's not my job to uh, even to respond. So uh, those who live their lives climbing or attempting to climb to the top by stepping on other people um, will have their karma, will have their day, but it's of no value to me to engage. So I was wrong about that. Number eight, I was wrong about rejecting authority. And so uh, much of my life, I had been very rebellious, disobedient. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. I think that's an Aries thing also too, but it's about being the oldest child. And also, uh, it's been about having an alpha male father who he and I, when I was younger, would, uh, we would bump heads, I guess you would say, because I'm a ram and, uh, and my dad's an alpha. And so... Uh, I, in order to assert myself and to establish my young ego, I did much to grow in disdain towards authority. And I carry that into my adulthood. And uh, in my adulthood, that, that rejection of authority has not given me or empowered me to step into my own authority. And so that's one of the things that I, I wanted to bring to your attention as I share this with you, is that the more you reject leadership, reject authority, you is the more, the more you move from the realm of your own authority and your own leadership. And I have paled, I've suffered. I had much shadow work to do as it relates to my own authority and to my own leadership skills. 
and it hasn't been until I it hadn't been until I've been able to accept uh, authority that I can stand in my authority. So I'm pretty. That's pretty fascinating. Mm, let me move on here. Computer's glitching here. Way number eight that I was wrong as fuck is in reading and consuming too much. And uh, I don't want to say it was something I was wrong about, It was some, but it was something that needed to, I needed to gain some perspective on. When I started out on my journey of adulthood, which I believe starts at the age of 24, around you know, 23, 24, 25, um, thereabouts, uh, that's really when you go into, you go into the world. You're going into the real world. This is when I got married. This is when you start your career. This is when you start a new, brand new 12-year path, a 12-year trip around the clock where you are receiving your mission for, for that phase of your life and allowing it to integrate and show itself to you over the next 12 months. And so during those years, for me, there was no internet or there was very little internet. There was like, I don't think Google was around yet. Um... So the internet was in its infancy, and so it wasn't even like uh, Vogue because it became in Vogue once YouTube came about, and um, and the information started to explode on the internet to to consume information and education and ideas. Uh, I was unique in that I became addicted to reading books, and I would just consume audio books. I was buying them on CDs and tapes, and reading books. And uh, none of my friends, they, I mean, they weren't into this. In fact, when I started making YouTube videos and talking about uh, reading books, many of you who've been around for a long time know that I've inspired you. I inspired you to read more books. Um, and then, you know, Ty Lopez took that and turned it into a whole, a whole way of being, knowledge. And you know how you needed to read thousands and thousands of books. Well, I think it's good to read books when your soil is ready to receive the seeds of new inspiration. But very quickly, you've got to move from the, the, the planting of seeds, meaning that there's going to be a season, there's going to be a phase where you're, you, you, you're, it's just raining down as far as ideas, into a season of nurturing those seeds um, allowing the ones that need to pass away to pass away, allowing the ones to start to germinate that need to germinate, watering the ones that are growing uh, and reject and get rid of the ones that are that have pests. And that's the cultivation process that ultimately leads you to the harvesting. So if you think of ideas, you think of books, you think of consuming, even when you go on, like I've recently been going on uh, YouTube binges watching you know, content from people, this has kind of been a new thing for me because I am at the start of a new journey for me and I've been taking in lots of seeds. Uh, you know, I turned 40, so you know, past three, four years. Uh, my point here is that although you may go through seasons of consuming, you've got to drop the consumption and go into seasons of producing. And so... Uh, I was wrong about that. You don't need to have lots and lots of books. In fact, it's better to purge your library or prune your library every once in a while. And that basically means get rid of the books that no longer serve you. Get rid of books that, uh, that aren't timeless for you. That's the other thing too. We don't want to be consuming books because they're on the, uh, you know, the bestseller list or because everybody says you're, you should be reading it. In fact, most contemporary books bore me to fucking death. And a lot of the books that, that are mainstays in my library are books that are written at least 50, but up to 100 plus years ago. I find that the older the book, the more timeless it is and the more important it is and the more I'll refer back to it. Most pop culture books are a rehash of dumb ideas um, that, that have all content and no context to them. And I'll leave it at that. And that brings us to number 10. Number 10 way of being wrong as fuck for me is uh, that I need to eat lots of food in order to be strong. And so uh, I adopted this idea very early on when I started lifting at the age of 14. And, uh, and so, of course, you start lifting, the appetite goes up, and I started getting huge. 
And so I was gaining weight at a rapid rate when I was younger, but I was eating a lot of food, tons of food, and I was getting fat. I looked at pictures that Colleen put up for my birthday party the other day from when I was, you know, about 16 years old, and I was fat. And I had been fat on and up, most, mostly on, but on and off for the past 20 plus years, 25 years. And it's because I've always been under this uh, illusion that I start lifting and then I start eating. And there have been times when I, I, I've lifted and I've gotten lean because I was fasting. And every, anytime that you see there's a, there's a lean Elliot on YouTube, it's, it's because, oh, he must be fasting again. And so um, <laughs> I made this mistake right up until earlier or, or late last year, exactly a year ago, basically a year ago, I came uh, to YouTube and I, I talked to you guys about uh, getting into my best shape by the time I was 40. And I figured, oh, I need to bulk before I, because I knew I was going to cut down. I need to bulk up and gain some muscle. Look at pictures from last August and September when I'm doing 100 rep sets. I was fat again. <laughs> I just couldn't help it. And so I've come to realize that um, that was a misconception. I was wrong about that. You don't need to eat a lot of food to be strong. In fact, you can stay at or below maintenance and still gain a lot of strength. You're not going to get that muscle bloat or that uh, puffy muscle that I often often have. You're going you're gonna to be lean. You're going to be fit. You're going to be strong. You're going to have that, that myofibrillar hypertrophy. That we all want, right? Don't you want to be lean? I don't see any reason to be huge. Uh, number 11 way that I was wrong as fuck in my 40 years uh, is about this idea of starvation mode. This kind of fits right in there with the food thing. I always thought that if I, if I, if I didn't eat every two to three hours, my muscles were going to disintegrate and, and, and disappear, which is ridiculous. Uh, in fact, I've learned recently through the wonderful scientific research that's finally been done, I don't know why it's taking so long, around the benefits of fasting, that uh, not only does starvation mode not kick in when you fast, it does kick in when you minimize calories, though. You can go to starvation mode uh, by eating a, a low-calorie diet that's high in insulin spikes, meaning like uh, high in carbs, high in protein. You can, you can go into starvation mode, but you will not go into starvation mode by fasting. Because in fact, once about 24 to 36 hours pass, your body goes into a state of ketosis and all kinds of magical shit like autophagy kicks in. And one of the things that we now know is that your body goes into a muscle sparing effect where Growth hormone, they say, you know, and I say they say because I'm just pulling this from what I've seen and read. Uh, growth hormone goes up by something like 300 percent. When I read that, I thought I was reading like a, a, a hypey sales letter, but it was from some legit sources. And so, uh, you know, do your own research. It's not my job to reference everything for you guys. My, it's my job to to share some ideas and f to see whether or not of any value to you that's another reason why uh responding to detractors is dumb because i'm not trying to prove anything i'm just spitting some ideas if you like them check them out try them out way number 12 that i was wrong as fuck was with my rejection of science and so i have to be completely honest i've never been a fan of needing to reference every fucking thing that i say with multiple scientific points and so um, I have always opted and leaned towards the subjective in my life, the experience in my life. And so uh, I've always been fascinated with and moved by poetry and mythology and religion and anything that was too boxed in, too physically authoritative, um, and too worshipped in the what I would call scientism way, because science in many ways has become a religion, and that's part of the reason why I was, you know, rejected it. Uh, was something that I would much rather push away from. And I think it has a lot to do with the authority issue in me, the authority rejector in me, and uh, and 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 not lean on for reference. 
And so I don't, I didn't need something. Just like I even said, I'm a religious guy and I don't lean on the Bible. I don't need to lean on the Bible. I don't need to quote the Bible to be religious and to be a Jesus fan. Big time. I don't need to reference a thousand different scientific studies in order to, to believe something or to assert something. So, um, but I think I may have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And so, uh, of course, you know, we, we love science when it validates what we already believe. And so I've had a, a ton of really strong beliefs that I didn't need any validation for, that it's amazing now to see science validating, uh, one of which is fasting. You know, um, when I was prompted by my soul to begin fasting, and I instead opted to listening to outside resources. Uh, there were in this, which is about four years ago. There was no, there was very little to no scientific research around fasting. And so, as I have adopted the fasting focused lifestyle once again, all of a sudden, just these past like year or so, all the scientific research has been coming out, and I love the fact that it's validating what I already subjectively believed. So you know. It's not about tearing science down through, you know, the way I used to, but it's definitely not about putting it on a pedestal because science is just as subjective in its, in its propagation as subjectism, subjectivism. And so more than anything, science has become a religion uh, that's used for power in order to push certain agendas. And most science is not real science, it's scienceism. Because, and you know it's true because all you gotta look at are who's funding the science and what their agenda is. Most of the science that we're, we're force fed have all kinds of presuppositions. I think a great book that, uh, that if, you, if, you're, if you're more interested in the things that I'm talking about uh, is by Rupert Sheldrake. Sheldrake, Rupert, Rupert Sheldrake. He was on London Real not too long ago. And he's got a book called Science Unleashed. And you know, it's a very scientific book because he points out where science is acting very much like a subjective religious experience. So I'll stop there. Number 13, the 13th way or thing that I was wrong about was taking full responsibility for how my children are. And before I had children, uh, I would look at people and see their children and I'd say, oh, their children are a mere reflection of them in all their greatness and shadows. And I would, you know, blame the parents or praise the parents based on how the children were. And so uh, I was wrong, you know, and I, I always believed that, you know, my children are going to be perfect examples of me. <laughs> how egotistical. And although they are, and I can see many of my gifts and many of my curses, many of the ways I was wrong that show up in my children's character, um, that now I, you know, get to watch that karma play out, uh, are true. But also I have to admit that, you know, there's nature and nurture. And although nurture is a great deal of the, of the situation, nature, man, they just come out the way they are. <laughs> and so I look at my children now as they're getting older and that's why I can, I can say these things. And I'm like, damn, you're exactly the way you were when you first came out. There, there are certain traits and behaviors and attitudes that my children display that I know I can't take responsibility for because within the first few hours of them emerging from the womb, I recognize these traits <laughs> in so many different ways. So um, there's that. And then there's also each child, every person, comes into this world with their own agenda. They choose us as vessels and as caretakers, but they're here to transcend all that and to have their own experience and to have their own journey. And, um, and we can't take responsibility for that because they have their own soul's contract, their own journey. So there you have it. Number 14 way that I was wrong as fuck is as it relates to the Baha'i faith. And so uh, 
there is much praise in my heart and much good that has come out of the Baha'i faith, namely the, I love the writings, particularly of Baha'u'llah, who is thought of to be the messenger, the Jesus figure, or the Muhammad figure, or the Buddha figure in the Baha'i faith. And so I really fell in love in, with his writing. Um, but as is always the case, once the, once the manifestation, once the teacher dies, then all hell breaks loose. And uh, the Baha'i faith has made an attempt to, 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 to create and to in, in, indoctrinate a political and an administrative agenda that, um, that I, don't, I, I, I don't agree with. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, so uh, if you're wanting to know about the beautiful mystical work of Baha'u'llah, uh, the, book that, the first book I would recommend is... Um, the hidden words uh, also to the gleanings of the writings of Baha'u'llah uh, very mystical stuff very beautiful work very poetic very religious I love it good stuff now where I was wrong as it relates uh, to the Baha'i faith is number one the way I chose to come into the Baha'i faith and it, ha it came on the backs of my rejecting Christianity because Christianity was very secularized uh, and also very sectionalized, and that meant also very um, uh, segregated. And being of mixed race, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in this video also too, uh, it was a, a shadow area for me, a sore spot for me to not quote-unquote fit in and, you know, uh, I had to get over that. I had to learn to get over that. But when I adopted the Baha'i faith, what really drew me in was its globalist perspective that we are all one, we are all the same, and that we should all ultimately blend into one gray, homogenous, prototypical, consumer, taxpayer, one world religion, one world government, type drone and of course i'm saying that you know from my perspective today um <laughs> so that you could you could sense a little of disdain there um but you know a part of the way that it drew me in was its magnet towards multicultural multiculturalism which i was a prime candidate for and so i'll talk more about uh globalism and race mixing in the next two points but i was wrong i was wrong about the baha'i faith um uh, an, another, like I said before, I am not a fan of the of the of the agenda, um, particularly the administrative order uh, and some of the practices thereof. It may have something to do with my primal rejection of authority, but um, but I also have dug much deeper, and I'll talk more about that in uh, in the next two points. So point number 14, where I was wrong as fuck over the past 40 years, is with regard to globalism. And like I said, I thought that uh, at some point that, you know, the whole world needed to come together and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I realized that um, although that's a great existential idea, that's a great metaphysical idea, it's very idealistic, it's not only not realistic, which I could talk about later, but those who perpetrate or propagate that agenda do not call for and as, 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 aspire to and want us to all become happy, go lucky, kumbaya people. What they're looking for through this push of globalism, through these, through, through a borderless world, through the erasure of the difference between the sexes, the erasure of the differences between the religions, the erasure of the differences between uh, cultures and race is to create a one race of consumers. Globalism is not about loving one another and coming together in peace. It is about creating a prototypical consumer slash taxpayer in the global economic market. It's about power. It's not about transcendentalism and good vibes, which I 
originally thought it was. I do believe that we are best served by getting along with our neighbors and trading fairly with one another. Um, but it stops there. I think there is great value in maintaining borders. I think it's so funny that Donald Trump is trying so hard and he is succeeding because he's a, he's a winner uh, to build this border around America, which only makes sense, which is very practical, very normal, very natural, and must be done uh, in this world that is they're aiming to create a borderless world uh, is not just a is a physical border, but what we're suffering from in a myriad of different ways is this lack of boundaries, this lack of board, this borderlessness in our in our character, in our morals, in our values, in our virtues. We live in a world where anything goes, and we're suffering. That's why the the the, the mental state of humankind is suffering. We've got anxiety, we've got depression, we've got suicide. We're all fucked up because there are no borders. So there's globalism for you. Number 16 way that I was wrong as fuck for the last 40 years is as it relates to race mixing. And this sounds tough and it's kind of along the same lines. And if you look at me, I am what you, <laughs> I am what you would call or what uh, Jack Donovan calls in his book, uh, Build a Better B Barbarian or some shit like that. Um, cappuccino colored. Cappuccino colored, which I think actually think is pretty good because it's a pretty color. It's a nice color. I'm grateful for who I am and what I look like. I am grateful for my experiences in this life as a mixed race person. But I am grateful also too that I can get over the sore spots that I know all people of mixed race suffer from. We are in pain, people of mixed race. And you know it too, those of you guys who are clearly of mixed race. I'm not talking about people, oh yeah, my mom's uh, Italian and my dad is Irish. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You're white and white. I'm talking about people who are white and black or white and Indian or white and Asian, uh, where there's a clear there's a clear distinction between the different parts of who we are. You know, I, I, I can look pretty damn white. I can act white, talk white, got blue eyes, but then I got these nigga lips right, which are so beautiful. Mm, and the big wide palate and nostrils, you know, that, uh, that are, are, are very African, are very primal in that way. And I love the fact that I, you know, that I'm, I am both ways. But the pain that we experience as mixed race people is a deep primordial need for belonging. And Although I believe that we can transcend that, like I transcend that and I have a deep sense of belonging as it relates to uh, American values um, and Jesus and religious values and uh, as it relates to being a man, masculinity, manhood, all these things, um, I, I, have, I suffered much uh, not knowing who I am, where I fit in. Uh, the blacks, the whites, both were uh, opportunistic in various ways, and you know I was I was good to them when when it was good for me to be good to them, and I chose chose them when it was better for me to be a part of either one of them. Um, but I think it I think we would be far better off, and I and I and a lot of these are new ideas for me that I've been only been able to adopt by. Uh, even listening to and digesting the words of uh, Jesse Lee Peterson, uh, who's got a YouTube channel you guys might be interested in watching, where he talks about how uh, segregation wasn't nearly as bad as we have been forced to believe it is. And in fact, the African-American community did far better during the segregated times than when integration was forced. And so now in retrospect, I can see how the history lessons of the past that forced integration were uh, unnaturally forced. I think if integration happens, that it should, it should happen normally and naturally. I don't think we need propaganda and I don't think we need the state to force integration. But I also see that living side by side with uh, distinct cultures and colors is, is good 
because it allows each culture to do what it does best, each race to do what it does best. And as long as we can come together on fair meeting grounds and honor contracts, which I know doesn't always happen, and that's idealistic also too, uh, to do great work for one another. So Jesse Lee talks about how the African American community was, there were a ton of entrepreneurs because they were building up their own communities. They were businessmen, they were entrepreneurs. Uh, as opposed to being dependent on the state. You go into black communities these days, and you know it's not about being prejudiced because I can relate to both. You go to most black communities, and uh, they're not businessmen, you know, unless they're, they're, they're street hustlers. Um, and the majority of people are, are on government assistance. This is, what's, this is what integration has created for us. This is what state dependence has created for us. Uh, and I'm talking to black people uh, as, as a 50 percent black from African, from Africa. Um, so. Much of what we have been led to believe as it relates to racism, I think, has been uh, an agenda that has been pushed on us and it is wrong and it creates victims and uh and victors and it creates more separation than actual segregation does so um i'm going to leave that at that and move on to number 17. number 17 is about i was wrong about taking criticism and praise personally uh you know as much as i logically understood that it is not in my best interest to to uh, to believe what other people say and to take their criticisms personally, like I mentioned before, but also their praise personally, it's hard not to have the feelings associated with criticism and praise. And it's taken me some time to detach. You know, I knew this logically. Like I said, it, it was in my head, but not in my body because I would still feel the emotion. I'd still feel the anger come up when, uh, you know, or the joy, the pleasure associated with praise and criticism. Now, uh, the minute a negative feeling comes to my body when I'm being criticized or, the, or a prideful feeling comes into my body for, for, for being praised, excuse me, um, I detach immediately. And so uh, I, feel the, I feel it coming up and then I ignore it completely because it's not about me. Even the praise is not about me. And so that's that. So I'm getting on to number 18, 19, and 20. And then I'm going to speed through the rest of these because this video is taking pretty long and I'm doing a lot of ranting. So um, I'm going to move pretty quickly from here on out. And, and, you know, as you're listening, if you have any questions or concerns about some of the things I'm talking about, maybe I'll create deeper videos. So, you know, just if comment down below. Uh, I don't want to make this video much longer than an hour. We're, we're, we're approaching an hour here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of rapid fire through these this these next 20 and if you got questions about why i've changed my mind or how i changed my mind beyond just a little blurb that i'm going to give you jot them down below and maybe i'll make a video all about it hey that's probably a really good idea a good way to go about making my next 20 videos you guys ask me questions about anything that i've been talking about in any of these points where i was wrong as fuck and i'll start making some videos for you guys so let's get on to number number 18. Number 18, I was wrong about guns. I got them. I got plenty of guns now. I think it's every man's right and responsibility to have guns. When I lived in New York, which is a mainly liberal state, uh, I, I adopted the liberal idea that guns are bad. And they're for bad guys. Uh, I live in the South now, y'all. And everybody and their mama's got a gun because we know that it's the right thing for a man to do. Number 19. I was wrong about premarital sex. I no longer believe that premarital sex is a good idea. I don't think promiscuity for men or women are a good idea. And I think it destroys much of the sanctity and the, and the deep inherent physical and spiritual power that is released and cultivated during sex because we cheapen it. I think it's far better to go back to the conservative days where we got to date and know a little bit more about one another before we engage physically. Uh, because when you engage physically, and many men, you know this, 
you then begin to engage emotionally. And when you start having sex with a woman, you start having sex with a person before you really get to know them, which I think, you know, it'll take about a year to get to know someone really well. Six months at minimum, uh, your logic becomes blurred. And so you begin to see through the emotional lens of neediness and sex rather than logicalness and loving someone for who they are rather than how they make you feel. So that was number 20. Now I'm going to start in the rapid rapid fire fashion. I'm do my best here because I love to talk about these things. Uh, so I'm just going to I'm just going to rattle through them and leave them open ended for you. Way number 21 that I was wrong as fuck over the past 40 years was about rules and boundaries. I was wrong about that. I was wrong about my father. My father is very alpha, super strong, and one of the, if not the greatest hero in my life. I was also wrong about what it means to be a husband. Very wrong about that the first 40 years of my life. Uh, being a husband is far more than just being a partner, quote unquote, in a relationship. That's a term that's used in the secular world to uh, homogenize the relationship and to bring gay relationships into marriage, which, you know, I'm not against, but a husband and a wife. Uh, go beyond mere partnership. Number 24, I was wrong about smoking weed. It definitely sends you into a tunnel and keeps you there. Number five, I was wrong about getting back into debt. Many of you guys know that uh, I spent the first part of my career getting out of $90,000 debt, started making money again, and got right back into debt. And so one of the things I did was I bought a Tesla. Never had a brand new car before. I bought a Tesla. And then when I came to my fucking senses, I said, whoa, what did I do? I just got into debt. So those of you guys who want to know, I sold my Tesla. And now I got a pickup truck. And I don't owe much. Number 26 that I was wrong about, it was my blind generosity as a kid. I used to take it that everybody was good and everybody had my best interest in mind. And I used to dumb shit like give people my things. So uh, I remember being a kid and lending some kids from the other neighborhood my bike because he wanted to race. And he raced his friend on my bike and never fucking came back. So I used to have this blind generosity where I'd want to just give to everyone thinking that they had their, my best interests and that we all had each other's best interests in mind when I was, I was fucking wrong. Number 27, that sex is love. Uh, I mentioned this earlier with regard to premarital sex. Sex is weakness. Sex is neediness. Sex is low and unconscious. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong, but the way we practice it is low and unconscious. It can be brought up to the realm of spirituality though. But for the most part, the way we're practicing it is, uh, is in order to facilitate and to grasp and hold on to what we're really lacking and that shows up in our needy love, needy love. For the most part, sex is needy love. Number 28, I was wrong about Donald Trump. Make America great again. I think Donald Trump is amazing. And when he was running for uh, office, I didn't vote for him. I hated Hillary. I'm a re registered Republican, but the, I, was, I was taken in by the way the media began to portray him. And although I had sort of a sense that, boy, if the media hates him this much, there must be something good about him. He must be up to something. And I knew this because back in 2008 and 2012, when Ron Paul ran for president, which he was the reason why I became a Republican and I truly believed in his message of liberty. I mean, I was really a Ron Paul fan and became libertarian. Um, I saw what they did to him and how they silenced him and how they shut him down and made him look like something he wasn't. So when they were doing it to Donald Trump, I was like, oh, part of me was like, you know, they may, be, I may, they may be, there's something going on behind the scenes that I don't understand. 
But after further exploration and seeing how he's done these past few years and how he is as a man, I can't help but say that he is the alpha leader that America has been needing for so long. I mean, Obama is the essence of beta. And they even have this guy named Beta. Beta O'Rourke, who's running for president. There's no, <laughs> there's, there's no better option for America today than Donald Trump. Done. Number 20, 29, I was wrong about rap and pop music. Of course, I grew up listening to this bubblegum bullshit that tastes good on the tongue but sours the belly. And so, you know, uh, growing up, New York, I grew up around rap music. Hip-hop was came from New York. Pop music, which, you know, is the... Uh, rap music at least comes from a culture. It's garbage now because it's been adopted by and, and co-opted by the corporations to further the satanic agenda of the elites. Um, rap music is, uh, has been co-opted by pop music. There's not much rap music any longer. Not the rap music I grew up listening to. And so um, I always knew, always knew pop music was dumb, deleterious, degenerate shit that it doesn't it not only sound good, doesn't offer anything, but rots our brains and destroys our souls. So I was wrong about rap and pop music. Number 30, I was wrong about being passionate and ecstasy. That was uh, a former form, a former version of Elliot uh, would tell you that you got to be passionate. Follow your passion. Uh, I've learned that that is not actually the case. That's not actually true. Uh, passion is a wonderful way to get in touch with what's going on at an unconscious level because it is tapping into the emotional body. And if you feel an emotion about something, it means you ought to stop and read the omen. What is that emotion telling you? The emotion is not the spark. I used to think that the emotion, the passion, was what, you, was what should stimulate and then facilitate your action. Let it come and then move in a passionate way. No, passion, let, allow it to rise up and then create space from it so that you can now be logical about what that passion was all about, where it really comes from. And that word ecstasy is about having to always feel joyful and happy on this, on, on your passionate journey. All that's bullshit. All that is a, is a is a byproduct of a feminized mind that we have been conditioned into here in the West, mostly. I say the West, mostly the mostly the Western man has been feminized to this great degree. Um, to I'm sure to a degree in the East and the Middle East, but um, I see a lot of those men looking far more masculine and um, and less passionate as uh, as as Western men. Number 31, way that I was wrong as fuck was that everyone is equal and should be treated equally. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, we are not equal. Men and women are not equal. We're not equal in what we are and how we show up on the planet. Uh, blacks and whites, we're not equal. We're not equal in what we are and how we show up on the planet. Uh, different, we're, we're, we're just not equal. Um, we have various different mental capacities and emotional capacities and physical capacities. And um, I think life would be boring. And I also believe that this whole globalist agenda and push towards egalitarianism and equalism uh, is not about, um, you know, getting beyond the oppressed and the oppressor, which is also bullshit that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, it's more about creating more subservient tax paying consumers. And so uh, we, we need to honor our diversity. Diversity is not our strength. That's one of the things they like to tell us. Uh, but honor our diversity because it, uh, it allows us to recognize that although I am strong here, I am weak there, where you may be strong there and weak somewhere else. And it's okay, we're not equal, we're not on equal planes. We're not in equal playing fields. We all, are diverse and powerful in our own right. Number 32, where I was wrong as fuck, is about men with long hair. Particularly me with long hair. Let me put it that way. There are dudes with long hair that pull it off just well, and I think it's fine. <laughs> but I always thought from the time I was 14 years old, and you know, I wanted to grow my hair. I wanted to have all kinds of long, weird 
hairstyles and my dad r rejected it and said no and i think that's where my you know my want for long hair came about um my dad was like no you can't grow your fucking hair when i did start growing my hair uh as i made my way, way down into the tunnel experience three four years ago i realized like uh this is dumb and that i'm a warrior and the type of warrior i am wear short hair that's it that's all i gotta say about that i was wrong about how narcissistic and egotistical i really can be and really am at the deepest level and i knew this i discovered this during my tunnel experience when i realized how hurt my poor feelings were about being uh, rejected and not feeling passionate about things any longer and allowing my feelings. I think anytime we allow the outer world uh, to touch our hearts and to touch our emotional body in a way that causes us to either uh, move out with ungrounded glee or to, re or to retreat in with depression, both of them are highly egotistical and narcissistic. And I think I, a part of how I discovered my narcissism was not from my extroversion. That's not how I discovered it. I discovered it from my introversion. I discovered that I was, I was really being so too self-absorbed and that's why I turned inward. So, you know, a lot of people who walk around as victims, usually depressed people, Mm. they think that they're being selfless and that they hate themselves or, or reject themselves and that it is the furthest thing from being egotistical, but they've got the biggest fucking egos. The people who are, if you are depressed, just know that you are narcissistic as fuck. It has everything to do with thinking about yourself and how things should be and how you feel about them and being really just being turned in on yourself. You're just turned in. You really, we, all of, a lot of our, our problems come from being too self-absorbed. And I recognize that about myself. And so I had to come up and turn outwards in order to recover from that deep narcissism. Number 34, I was wrong about my addictive personality. In fact, I didn't know how addictive I am and how addicted to things I can get. And I have a tendency to become addicted if I don't pay attention. Uh, I talked about this in, in, a, in another video where, uh, you know, premarital sex became an addiction. I, I was addicted to the sex with my wife and then I became addicted to uh, building muscle. I became addicted to, uh, to, to winning trophies and winning, 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 winning with sports. Uh, these are all great things. Love my wife, uh, love my muscle, love winning, but they, they were, they were, uh, societally accepted addictions, not like crack or, or, or heroin, you know. Uh, also, I discovered through these past few years how food is an addiction, how addicted we are to food, how addicted we are to entertainment. I became addicted to smoking weed, you know. I got to be completely honest. I, I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to stop. And I, and I smoked and I smoked and I smoked for, uh, for a good three years or so. And so I realized that, you know, it was it was dumbing me down, but it was no less a part of my neurotic, narcissistic, addictive, addictive drive. So there's that. Um, I was wrong about how many lives I've impacted for the better. And so uh, I never realized, you know, this kind of like contrasts some of the things I was talking about being narcissistic. So uh, it's not about being narcissistic, about being realistic. And I've come to realize just how many people I've impacted in a deep and profound way in my life. Uh, I maybe even in my narcissism, I rejected just how much I've delivered my consciousness and been an uplifter on this planet. Um, and I don't even think I realized to what the great degree I've done that and who I am to the lives of millions of people on this planet. But I am now able to accept it before I was, uh, very fake humble about it meaning you know it had something to do with low self-esteem and like oh no no not me or oh you know anybody could do it no not anybody can fucking do it needed yo elliot to do it and to continue to do it and that's what i'm doing it's my purpose and my my mission i don't even have to make it my mission and i'll talk about that in, 
just a few here. It's what has unfolded in my life and it's who I am and I accept it. I accept it without egoism or without false humility. It's just what I am. I was wrong about what it means to be a good man versus being good at being a man. Another one that I recently learned from Jack Donovan. Uh, being a good man has a lot to do with the, the, the moral situations and issues in the world and what the uh, mostly the, the feminized culture wants you to be. And being good at being a man is more utilitarian and more deep and primal and, and grounded. Being good at being a man. One of the things is that's required for being good at being a man is being good with your hands. There's no question about it. We have been... Uh, fooled into a world where mind is is uh, over muscle and office workers and insurance salesmen and sitting behind a computer and being an influencer is more important than actual physical labor and doing work but that's wrong being good at being a man means that you're strong. It means that you're able. It means that you can do things, that you want to do things. And one of the ways that we share our love and give our love is not just by sitting behind a computer and allowing digits on a screen to tell us how much we're worth, i.e. cryptocurrency, which we're already in, even if we don't call it that. It's this digital money, which is fucking nothing. But we create things. We protect. We do things in the outer world. That's good at being a man, not being a good man who does what he's told. Number 37, I was wrong about oppression and victim groups. Uh, I am convinced that we've been fed a whole lot of bullshit as it relates to who is oppressed, how they've been oppressed, and who the oppressor is, particularly in America because we've got black and white, we've got female and male, and uh, that it's been played up by in, in its, and drama, dramatized by the establishment and those who seek to con, divide and conquer and control us and that if we can get over the victim stories that are uh, adopted and perpetrated and 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 loved so much by the quote-unquote oppressed classes in America and if the quote-unquote oppressors stopped allowing the guilt from the false education that causes us or them to feel like they're oppressors. I mean, you can't, you, you, the only way to, the, a big part of the way and the reason why the oppressed classes are gaining so much, they're not even oppressed classes, but the loud cloud classes are gaining so much power is because, just to be frank, white men are not standing up anymore. Straight, white, Christian men, you know, and I don't want to call them out as an oppressed class, but th th that class is considered the oppressor class. And we've been fed all, I, what I believe to be a whole kinds of historical bullshit that puts them there. And I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair for black people and women to think of themselves as oppressed. It's not empowering. It doesn't serve you in any way. It's not going to strengthen your cause. And, um, and I don't think it's of any value for straight white Christian men to, to, to adopt that white guilt. I think that's bullshit. I think it needs to be left behind. And I think we can do a lot better than this divide and conquer shit that, we've been, that has been shoved, shoved down our throats. Number 38, that evil does not exist. I was wrong about evil. I thought evil didn't exist. There was a time when I believed that everything in life was relative light or darkness. And uh, that meant that everything was good. And it just needed some time to be shown as good. No, I don't believe that any longer. I do believe that there are dark, evil entities and forces that are inherent in the universe. They're not going anywhere. They don't need to go anywhere. And, they're, and we don't even need to have judgment about them. But we must know that they're dark they're dense, they're lowly, and they seek to destroy. And they're present within us. And they're present around us. And that if we're not careful, as is in all horror movies, evil sneaks in the back do door at night when you're sleeping. Evil always presents itself either as beauty, 
meaning that you're completely hypnotized by the evil or through the back door. And so not only does evil exist, but it's been said that the greatest trick that Satan's played is to convince us that he doesn't exist or that evil doesn't exist. Evil must be respected as a living entity if good light, God energy is to be understood and adopted also too. We need that contrast. We live in the black and white. Of course, above us, there is the undifferentiated, as Carl Jung would call it, and it's all blended into one thing. But as we live in the flesh, as we're in this fallen state, as we are in 3D, there's black and white, there's up and down, there's male and female, and there is good and evil. Number 39, I was wrong about holding back on politics and religious speech. In fact, if it doesn't involve politics or religion, it's not worth talking about. There is nothing worth talking about if it, ha if it doesn't relate to uh, the, the politics of the world, the polis, where the word comes from, the political or the public or how the the physical world, our families, our communities, our states, our countries, our cultures reflect the soul of the individual man. We must get involved in politics. We must be vocal in politics. I, don't, I think that it's important for us to argue and, and to bring the political ideologies to the table so that they can be not necessarily even worked out, but expressed. Politics is not about changing anybody's mind. If you've noticed, as I've been speaking about many of my political convictions, uh, I'm not interested in changing anybody's mind. I don't think most conservatives are. <laughs> We're not interested in changing anybody's mind. We're just interested in laying the truth out on the table. Um, it, you know, and so I got to be completely political here when I say that the leftists and the leftists, the people of the of the political left, are the most violent and angry people that exist. It's so funny because they 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 give lip service to equal egalitarianism and now everybody getting along but they're the first to get angry and, and name call and they've got you know uh they've, they've got all kinds of angry groups like antifa and and the such that are out there um, um, um being antithesis to what i think they really want and so um that's it anyway as far as uh bring bringing religion that's the other thing. Um, if it doesn't have to do with the existential, it doesn't have to do with our meaning, our purpose, as well as walking with God or walking with nature, walking with the Tao, moving from the realm of matter and the mother and the material world to the realm of pattern and paternity and the father. Uh, if, if, if these things aren't discussed, if these things aren't explored, if these things aren't a major part of every discussion that we have, religion and politics, then we're just talking about dust. We're talking about nothing. We're wasting our time, jibba john, and we're not connected to our world and we're not connected to our metaphysical world. And finally, number 40, thing I was wrong about is about forcing versus allowing I am a willful man, pro-strong man, a man that makes shit happen. I am Mars. I am Achilles. I am a warrior in every way. I pick up swords and I destroy and create. But in these past few years, I've learned how to put the sword down because it is a lesser weapon than the scepter. And the scepter is the stance, it's the pole, it's the, the stick that a king holds. And a king doesn't need a sword because he is simply being. And in being, he's allowing his path, he's allowing his nature, he's allowing God to speak through him so that he can observe and allow and watch as his kingdom manifests around him. To be a king is not about doing. That's about the warrior. 
But if you're in constant warrior doing activity state, you never have the opportunity to relax, allow, and be as a king. Done.